is Thursday, September 16th, 2021. This is the TechSNEP, T-E-X-N-E-P, Texas Nature and Environmental Photographers. Uh, this is our uh, regular meeting. We've been doing them on Zoom for the last, I don't know, I think year and a half now. And we're not sure exactly when we'll be back at the library in McAllen, but for right now, we are still meeting on Zoom. So um, I was the founder of MONEP, Missouri Nature Environmental Photographers in St. Louis, Missouri. And that was back in 1996. And when I moved to Texas, my first uh, photography class wanted to start a camera club. And I told them about MONEP and we've sort of patterned ourselves after MONEP, a wonderful group. I met Linda, I don't know how many years ago, but Linda Nickel uh, and I have known each other quite a long time and she has encouraged me to do all kinds of things I wouldn't normally do, um, mostly having to do with social media. Um, but she invited me to do a session for her program, which is every Wednesday night on Zoom and it's called the Happiness Hour. Linda is on Instagram is Kazen Linda and uh, you can follow her there. Uh, you all have the notification for the meeting tonight and it does include information about Linda. But anyway, Linda and I have met in person several times. She's been down to the valley where I live and we're, um, we're good friends. And I don't know, after tonight, you might think this was a payback because I invited her <laughs> to a program instead of her asking me to do a program. But she is well known not just in Texas, but other places as well. And I think she's gonna talk a little bit about that. But uh, if there's nothing you want me to say in addition to that, Linda, I will turn this uh, program over to you and let you talk about your program and share your screen. Okay, great. Uh, before I get started, uh, I wanna thank TechSnap and Ruth Hoyt for inviting me to come and speak to the group. And uh, this is a great opportunity for me to share some of the images and stories that I have collected over the last three and a half years along a back road that I have kind of named Gully Road. So um, I grew up in LaSalle County, which is, if you're um, familiar with the interstate, I'm stuck somewhere between San Antonio and Laredo, about dead center. Um, Catula is the county seat there. And it's one of those small towns where nothing exciting happens. And when I graduated high school, you know, I left and I only went back to visit my parents and a, a couple of my friends from high school. But in 2017, my father passed away unexpectedly. And for months, every weekend, I was returning to, to get there, to help my mom get things settled. And it took us almost about six months before our routine was back to normal. And those mornings that my mother slept in, I would get up early and I'd wander along old dirt roads. This, my presentation, uh, you know, for lack of a better title, I called it Finding Beauty on a Back Road. So as a kid, you know, I would ride on my dad's tailgate and watch pastures and ranches and, and crop fields just kind of whiz by. And that's how I experienced nature. But after 40 years, things kind of look different. Um, you know, we're farms and ranches that I only, that I once knew really, really well. I was seen with fresh eyes. And through, and through a camera lens, the opportunities are endless. Um, these are just some images that I've taken over the last couple of years. Um, just to kind of give you an idea of things that I was, what, what I was finding. Actually, I kind of got on the road and I was, I really didn't have a plan. It was just to kind of wander and kind of see what was out there. But on my first wandering, I observed these scissor tails and they were, they landed on this fence. They kind of gave me that look. One took off in the middle of the air and the other one followed it and they danced and they played in the air and they came back to this exact same spot. And I thought that was really, really kind of odd until he did it again. And after the third time, it was one of those moments that you, I told myself, I cannot believe I'm seeing this. 
I don't really understand it. And the more time I've spent with the scissor tails, the more um, you get used to their, their activities. And um, one of the reasons I took this shot was one, I wasn't able to catch them in the air. This is one of the first photos that I took and I was a little new at wildlife photography. So the best I could do was catch them on a fence line. But I, I really liked this image because I was able to blur out my background and get them super sharp. And I love barbed wire. So this is just one of those shots, one of those memories for me that I, 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 I can take myself back there very, very quickly. So these old farms, they were once crop fields, cotton, peanuts, watermelons, um, any kind of crop that you can think of, that's what was out there. And these days, they're basically dotted with pump jacks. And you're going to, you know, I, I drive along these roads and, you know, they're just sprinkled out there. But on this particular morning, sunrise was, there is no other word for it, spectacular. And so I was able to capture this image. But on that first morning, I really didn't take a lot of photos. And I didn't really find anything interesting enough to keep. But the following weekend, I was back down there and I retraced my path and I turned down a different dirt road. And I started noticing wildflowers and they were beginning to bloom. And that's something that I never had really noticed down in LaSalle County. And I remember stooping down pretty low to get some, you know, a perspective. And I was able, you know, I, I, out of my peripheral vision, I could tell that somebody had flown over me. It was a really big shadow. And I had seen these crested caracaras. And I, it had been a long time since I'd seen those. But I got back in the car and I started driving along. And three or four utility poles later, I come across these vultures. And you're going to agree, vultures are very, very unattractive birds. But when you put then in the center of your lens, and you start zooming in on their details, you'll see the little wrinkles in their, in their faces and the colors and the feathers. You can pick up those uh, hues of blues. They're not just dark black birds. They've got blues and browns and just a tinges of red. So as a photographer, you start noticing details. So after a dozen or so photos, my interest was piqued. And the following weekend, I returned on Easter morning. And as I was crouched down, I came across this, this scene, but I, I noticed this cattle chute. And to be honest, I'm not sure if it was ever used or if this was just elaborate yard art for this ranch. But I thought to myself that, oh my gosh, I've got blue skies, green, green pastures. We don't really have that down in Catula. It's usually brown or green, but for whatever reason, this was done during the uh, super bloom of 2018. And every place that I had traveled through, you know, um, the hill country, I had gone to North Texas, I'd gone to East Texas, and even down in South Texas, we had flowers. And so this is kind of one of those pictures that I thought I've got to get a, get a shot of it. So right now I'm kind of crouched low. And I've got my camera wedged in between the rails of the gate. And I've got this photo. As a photographer, we're always looking for leading lines. We're always looking for something pretty. And I don't ever really remember anything really, really pretty, Katula. But this is one of those shots that takes me back. I can always, always, every time I pass this shoot, I just look and I'm looking for this scene and I haven't seen it since then. So that's one of the things as photographers, if you see something, stop and take the photo because it will not be there the next time you run by it. But as I stood up, I was startled and I startled a jackrabbit. He was running straight towards me. Um, neither one of us was, was prepared for the other. But I remember posting this on a Facebook page and um, it was a Texas Backroads page. Um, and I can remember going back and looking at all of the comments that I received on this particular image. And they were mostly not how great their jackrabbit was. This isn't a great photo of a jackrabbit, but the fact that people hadn't seen jackrabbits in years. 
But for me, they're very, very common down in South Texas. And so it just reminded me how big and diverse our state is and that there are treasures tucked in every little corner. So we just have to pull them out and share them with other people. So this picture right here, you're looking at the photo that kicked off my interest in wildlife photography. So this is also taken in during the super bloom, probably the next day actually. And, you know, Indian, some people call them fire wheels. When I was growing up, they were called Indian blankets. And this driveway up into someone's ranch just really drew me. And I thought, you know, I could take a picture of a big pasture and get all of those photos, all those flowers in really sharp detail. But what I really wanted was a slice of them. So I used a really um, shallow depth of field and I just got the ones right up front sharp. And with, you know, a very, you know, um, shallow depth, I've got that nice blur. And it kind of reminded me of, not that I'm comparing myself to Claude Monet, but it get, it's an impressionistic version of a flower field. And so I just, I really love this photo. So uh, most people will assume that there are flowers only in springtime. I did, I was one of those people. I didn't think that um, most of the temperatures in South Texas, you know, they kind of, you know, hover around the hundred degree marks in June, July, August, even September. But I took this photo in August. And this patch of flowers, I can't tell you what they are because I still haven't learned all my flowers, caught me off guard. When I saw this queen butterfly on it, I just, I really couldn't believe that this was, this was August. And I couldn't believe this was in South Texas. So as photographers, we really want those details and we really zoom in and you want that butterfly to be the huge focus, the subject of your image. But in this particular um, image, I wanted it, I wanted to show you its environment. And so that's kind of why I've left it that way. But I've got, trust me, I've got tons of photos where the butterfly is nice, big and bold and beautiful. But in this particular shot, I thought it was more interesting to kind of tell its story by showing you the field that it's hovering around. I was actually on my way to a cardinal nest when the sun started coming up. And I really hadn't planned, I'm really terrible about this. Most photographers will plan for their sunrises and their sunsets. I won't do that, but I tend to be one of those people that, oh, if I see it, I'll stop. If I, you know, if, it, if it's there, I'll take advantage of it. But this particular morning, um, this was taken in December. And there was just a little bit of Christmas in the air. And this is an old Wiesatch tree that has lost, lost its leaves. But as that sun came across the horizon, the sun rays were undeniably gorgeous. So I had to, I had to pull over and take this shot. This is also the same, very same tree. This was taken in October. So one of the things that um, I'll, I'll tell people is when you go back to a place over and over, you have those opportunities to photograph that subject at different times of year and different phases of its life. So as you're working on projects, consider doing that. In October, the Wiesatch leaves are pretty much, they're actually almost crispy at this point. They're really almost ready to fall. But this is a representation of what autumn can look like in South Texas. So this is a maize field that I drive by every time I'm on Gully Road, every time. And this is an early morning photo. And I purposely, again, chose a shallow depth of field. And I focus on this red-winged blackbird. I don't know my birds, I'm learning them, but I can tell you the only bird song that I can recognize is a red-winged blackbird. And that's because a year earlier, I had spent easily an hour, two hours in this field with the red winged blackbirds. And that's the only song that's kind of etched into my brain. I really wanted to kind of show him and his environment. Again, as photographers, we really tend to zoom in and try to grab that, that subject and make it really big in the frame. But in this particular shot, I, I really wanted to show what he was doing, 
and where he lives and where he eats and where he, you know, woos his lady friends. Two weeks later, this is the same maize field. And this is actually taken at the hottest, brightest, harshest light of the day. This is taken about 2.30 in the afternoon. Typically, I wouldn't have taken a shot, but when you see the light and you know you've got a lens that's gonna create beautiful bokeh, you take advantage of it. And is this a perfect shot? No, it's not. It's, it's not gonna win any contest. But for me, it tells a story of what light can do to the subject. So. Even if you don't think it's a good shot, take it, delete it later. Nobody has, nobody needs to know about it, but take advantage of light. When I first started um, looking for birds, I didn't really know my birds. And, and I know that um, most people are just cringing inwardly because I know there are a lot of birders in this room. Um, everything was an LBB, a little brown bird, an LGB, a little gray bird to me. But the bird just blended in so beautifully with its environment. The bird is the subject. I'm not going to debate that. But for me, growing up in South Texas, what drew me to this image is the chain link fence. As a kid in South Texas, if you're not fast enough and you can't grab the middle seat, you're stuck at the door. And whoever sits in the passenger seat at the door is opening and closing gates all over South Texas. And I close many gates, but this particular um, image with the metal, and then you've got the post and you've got the barbed wire, and then you've got the, the, the pokey thorns of, I believe that's the mesquite tree, I may be wrong. Um, I just thought all those different textures brought this photo together. And even though, the mockingbirds, you know, just kind of fades into the background. It just is a really beautiful photo because you can tell, you know, using shallow depth of field again, I'm going to talk about that a little bit because I love it. You know, there's a tree back there, but you don't need to see it sharp. So um, play with your different uh, apertures and, and take those photos that you want to, to show off. But for me, I really wanted that really buttery background in this particular shot. As I'm driving around, you know, I'm kind of got my, my spidey senses. And, you know, when you go slow enough, you're able to notice things. And I had driven past this nest. And as I drew, drove past it, my brain said, I think there's something there. And I remember stopping and looking and I didn't see anything, you know, in the direction that I thought I saw something. And I thought, you know what? I paid for this car. It makes U-turns. Let's go back and look. And so what I did was I did a U-turn and I still didn't see this guy or this lady. And I thought one more time. And on my second pass, she moved her tail feather. It was just enough to get, catch my eye. And I, she is quite a ways away. And this is a very cropped in image, but I really wanted, this was also the first bird I'd ever really seen sitting on her nest. And I really wanted the shot. So I didn't think that it was gonna be really sharp, but when I got it back on my computer screen, I was absolutely tickled to see that she sharp, got a little, I think I cut off her tail a little bit, but I've got her on her nest in her home. Um, she's got babies coming and it's, it was just, it was a fun find. And if you are speeding down the road, you're not gonna be able to notice these little things. This is, I believe, and Ruth's gonna correct me, but I believe it's an Eastern Kingbird. And I didn't really know at the time what the bird was and I really didn't care because all I was interested in was his little yellow belly. And I was, now I, I really work hard at not taking photographs of anything on barbed wire or, fence post or utility poles, you know, the birds on the stick. I'm trying to avoid that, but I would still take this photo because he graciously landed in a, you know, where I'd get these um, wild sunflowers as my backdrop. So I just thought the colors were delicious. And so I'm, I'm really thrilled to have this one in my catalog. A lot of us love and have been very fortunate to see painted buntings. And if you have it, 
if you're a birder and you haven't found one, I'm, I'm going to cross my fingers that you get a chance to, to run across one because there is nothing more special than seeing one of these guys with your own eyes. Um, this photo is not uh, saturated. A lot of people ask me, you know, did you jack up the colors? And I did not. In fact, I actually had to desaturate him because, you know, you find birds when they want to be found. And this one was taken around two, maybe 2.30 in the afternoon. So the light's really, really harsh. You can kind of tell from the shimmer on, on his feathers, but honestly, I don't care. It's a painted bunting and he is so cute and he's so smart. And if you can, if you'll notice his little claw has got that little stem clamped down. So as he's picking those little seeds, he's not gonna lose his stem. So he, they're lovely birds. So if you, if you haven't seen one, add that to your list. The, I don't know what they're called, a flock. I don't really know what turkeys are called, but they actually cross the street in front of me, cross the road. And yes, I have plenty of pictures of them in the road, but I really wanted to get them into the grasses. And so I pulled over and waited for them to, to kind of get reoriented and, and get themselves, you know, not too concerned that I was there. And as you can tell, a few of them are on the lookout. They're not real sure what I'm doing, but you know, the others are, I'm hungry and, and, they're, and they're just going about their own business. Took this photo, got as many of them as sharp as I could. And when I got home, then did I realize, oh my gosh, that it's not just a, um, the backdrop, they're in grasses, there's pops of yellow flowers. Um, the way they are framed in these grasses. I was super, super excited. That's one of the first things that we learn as photographers is to mind your backgrounds, watch your borders. And I did not care. So um, to be honest, this was a very, very lucky shot that I was able to get as many of them into the frame and as cleanly as I got them. There is a puddle. Um, it, first of all, South Texas, you know, so you will agree, we don't get a lot of rain, but there's a puddle every once in a while on this little dirt road. It's, you can't tell from this picture, but it's about the diameter of a trash can lid. It's a very, very small puddle. And every once in a while there's water in it. And every time I drive by it, I, I just kind of tell myself, wouldn't it be cool if I could catch someone taking a drink or just anybody near the water. And about a couple of weeks after I kind of said that out loud of, I really wish I could get a bird just taking a drink. I came around the corner, around the curve and happened upon this cardinal. And I was able to rattle off seven shots. The first two were blurry. This was the third shot and the rest of them I didn't even care about because this was the shot that I was after. Moments like that happen so, so quickly. And so, uh, and I guess I should point out that most of these photos, I would say 80% of the photos that you're seeing tonight are taken from my car, which I'm using as a blind. Anybody that is into birding knows that as soon as you stop a car or roll down a window or heaven forbid, open the door, wildlife is gonna take off and birds are no exception. There's very few um, times that I've been able to step out of the car without them taking flight. But this was just one of those photos that I just, I loved and I'm super happy to have it in my collection. Little Bob White Quail. There are so many of them in South Texas, but as ground runners, they're fast. And as soon as one spots you, he'll take off and, and his buddies will, will go along with him. This particular day, I was photographing butterflies and I just happened to pull over. I'm taking shots of the butterflies and I kind of glanced over to my left because something caught my eye and it was his first little quail. And I thought, wait a minute, he's coming towards me. That never happens. And he jumped up on this old log that was kind of just you know, in the underbrush, and he started moving closer to me, very inquisitive, and then his buddy jumped on, and then another one jumped on. At one point, I had seven quail on this log, 
And, but of all the shots that I took, and I did take a lot of them, I particularly like this one. I like the way their heads are, you know, the, what they're, you know, you've got somebody on the lookout, you've got one that's super, super sharp, and they just kind of fade off into the background. This particular shot, if you shoot birds and you got to use high ISOs, which is what I had to do here. Uh, this is something that, you know, I did have to run through to noise to get some of that grain out and to bring back some of the sharpness. So don't, don't, uh, don't be afraid to, to sharpen and to denoise your images because the software that's available is really, really good now. All right, this is some turkey vultures. This is my favorite tree along Gully Road. It's an old dead tree. In the spring, you've got trees kind of growing underneath it, and that's what, what's happening here. But in the fall, there is nothing. It's just dead um, trunks that are just kind of standing. And every time I drive by this tree, there is a different bird on it. Sometimes it's a cardinal. Sometimes it's a mockingbird. I've actually ran into a situation where I saw a painted bunting, a cardinal, and a Baltimore Oriole all on the same tree. It's very rare, but, but I do have photos of that. But this particular day I drove by and I saw so many turkey buzzards and they are all in that, I think it's called horaltic pose. And if I'm mispronouncing it, I apologize for that. But I didn't really know what that was until I posted it and it made a kind of a funny and said, you know, they're all bowing to the queen. And then all the birders came out to correct me and tell me that, you know, this horaltic pose is basically um, a way that they, you know, warm themselves up. And there's, um, sometimes it's the sun that's kind of, you know, helping them dry out their feathers. So there's a reason for it, but I still choose to believe they're bowing towards me. When you get those opportunities, sometimes, you know, sometimes the birds are gone. Sometimes the big mammals are it's too hot, but there are always bugs to be found. And in the springtime, um, you'll see a lot of wildflowers. You'll see, you know, not necessarily just wildflowers, berries, trees, leaves, bark. Pull out your macro lens and play. One of the exercises I gave myself was to pull out my little step stool. I carry one in my back of my car. And I only let myself sit straight towards a bunch of flowers. And I only gave myself about four feet to work in. And I sat there and sat there and I thought nothing's coming, but bees never disappoint you. And if you just wait long enough, you'll get to see other, you know, critters or flies and spiders. With your macro lens, just keep looking because on a dewy day, those little spider webs are going to pop out at you. This spider web taken with a macro is, it looks impressive. I think the dew drops are beautiful, but in reality, it's a teeny tiny little spider web. But with a macro lens, it pulls out those details and it's just kind of fun to, to play with. And unfortunately I couldn't find with a spider, but I'll take a spider web any day. Also with your macro lens, um, Typically, and I do have a bunch of shots of just those thorns and they're just, you know, they look a little sharp and edgy and that's what, that's their job. But with your macro lens, if you back up and use it as a real, you know, a full, full lens, you can get some super sharp images. And this is one of the pear cactus that is, it dots South Texas and everybody probably in this room knows what pear cactus is, but you're going to find plenty of it. And we all take pictures of it. So start playing with different angles and different perspectives. You know, don't just stand straight up and look at it and aim at it, get low, you know, shoot sideways, you know, play with your camera, play with your lens, because what you're looking for is a perspective or an image that no one else has taken. So on the other end of your lenses, I, I shoot with a very large zoom lenses. And this was taken with a 200 to 500 millimeter from quite a distance. I'm after that little B. And so mm, I don't always wanna get up, up close and personal. And especially 
uh, right now I'm practicing uh, capturing them in the air. So I need to give myself a little bit of room. But with patience and a good lens, just park, pull over, get out of your car if you want to, sit on a stool if you have time, pull over, see what comes near you, see what comes you know, by you and take that shot. I have been driving this stretch of road for over three years, almost three and a half years. And I have been looking for a coyote. I, you know, there's lots of birds, South Texas, uh, this part of Texas is right in the migration path. So we see a lot of birds. I don't see a lot of coyotes, even though I know they're out there. Um, this particular day, I was kind of coming around a corner and it's one of those things that just catches you off guard because he, she, I'm not sure what, blends so well with its environment. It was very difficult to see. This particular coyote was, you know, okay with me taking his photograph because I have tons and tons of them. But what I was after was showing the wildlife that wanders through here. And, and typically I see coyotes early morning, late in the evening. And I don't think, I, I can't remember the last time I've seen one in the daylight. So this was a particular treat to have really good light to capture him. This little guy, I'm actually driving, I drove past his little den area. And as I did that in my peripheral vision, I saw movement. And then you hit the brakes and you think, what did I see? And I put it in reverse and I didn't see anything. And I thought, I know I saw something. And I just kind of sat there for about a minute and I could see the shadows. And I had a mama and two little babies. I never got a shot of the babies. They never came out of the hole. And I thought, all right, I'm waiting. And so I pulled over and I waited for this shot. It took me about 45 minutes for her to come out. And that's as much of her that I got to see. She poked her head out, checked me out and went back in. A lot of people tend to, well, look at this picture and go, that's not perfect. Well, it isn't because there's leaves in her face and it kind of, you know, um, she's kind of wrapped up in them. And, you know, I had a friend actually suggest, I would, I was, you know, erase those leaves. And so for, and that's a personal preference. For me, I really work hard at, I don't want to Photoshop animals. I want them to look the way I found them. And so that's that's the reason I left that. All right, for those of you that don't like snakes, I'm gonna warn you to look away. But I actually saw a very large spider web from the road and I pulled over and I got super excited, grabbed my macro lens and walked right up to it. And I was right up at it and I was getting my focus on it. And then I heard the rattle and it's like, oh gosh, oh gosh. I know that's a rattlesnake. I just don't know where it is. And without moving, I looked down, I couldn't see anything. I looked around without moving my head. It was, it's a horrible sound to hear, but it's also one of those, oh my gosh, there's a rattlesnake. So I finally realized him, he, she was probably about six feet away from me good distance, but I think I was in striking distance of it. And it rattled for a very long time. So I stood very, very still. And as soon as it stopped rattling, I figured it settled down. And so I backed up and I, I was far enough where I could like now run to my car and grab my long zoom lens and swap out lenses. And I ran back and from the safety and using a, I believe I was using a 600, uh, 150 to 600 millimeter lens. I was able to grab this shot. And this is the only snake photo that I've taken that I'm proud enough to share with you guys. But it's also the last snake picture that I really need to take. But um, South Texas, you, you need to wear your snake boots. And I wasn't doing that. Um, you need to, to pay attention to where you're walking. I wasn't doing that. I got caught up in a spider web, which by the way, I don't have a photo of, but I do have the snake picture for the collection. I was driving down the road and it had been a little muddy. It had rained a couple days earlier. So one of the roads were, was a little mushy, but as I came across this area, 
I saw big piles of yellow leaves. And as I got closer, those yellow leaves kind of lifted and flew and landed into another spot. And as I was able to get close enough to them, I realized they're not leaves. They were clusters of, um, I believe they're called orange sulfur butterflies. And I see them everywhere, um, usually around flowers, but I had never seen them in mudding or muddling. And so this was one of those um, very special photos for me because that was my first experience of being able to see this many butterflies congregated in one area. So there's also these little bitty, I think this is called a hackberry butterfly. And if I'm incorrect, please feel free to correct me in the chat. I liked taking this photo because it blended so well into its environment. And this photo reminds me how nature adapts and protects itself. And it, it's also fun because I was able to share this with um, my godson at one point. And, and he was young enough where I could ask him, can you find the butterfly? So these were just kind of fun images to kind of have and play with. And for me, it just reminds me this butterfly is probably the diameter of, of maybe a dime, just a little bit bigger than a dime. It's tiny, so you've got to really pay attention um, to see some of this stuff. This is the same butterfly, except now it's on the road and it's, it's got its wings nice and wide open and he still kind of color coordinates with his environment. Um, I actually watched this butterfly for a little bit and it would fly and then it would, you know, land somewhere else. And at one point I kind of lost track of it and I knew it hadn't flown off. And it took me a couple of seconds to find him again because he blended in so well with these rocks. All right, this, okay, everybody that is a photographer that's working on a project, and I don't want to say Gully Road, what started out to be my project, it has become my project. But as photographers, we all start with a shot list. And after photographing this area for a couple of years now, I kind of realized I'm missing some photos. And so on my shot list, I've always had a bobcat. I've always wanted an owl. I've loved to find a fox. I'm not even sure foxes are in that area of the state. I think there are, but I've never seen one. So you have this fantasy list and um, I've been looking for an owl for a long, long time. Um, typically I go on my, on my wanderings by myself, but on occasion my mom will tag along with me. And on this particular morning, she said, I'll, I'll go with you. And I said, that's fine. But typically she'll get in the car and we'll be off. And maybe 10 minutes later, she's already asleep. But I had told her, look, you cannot fall asleep because I'm on a mission. And I said, I want a bobcat, an owl, and I want a fox. And a javelina would be nice. I said, any of those things, I'll pay you $20. And my mom just kind of looked at me and she said, I'll take your money. And so I, you know, started driving and we were wandering around and lots of birds and lots of deer that day. And about 45 minutes into our drive, my mom taps me on the shoulder and she says, look, and I'm like, what does she see? And she had had a cataract surgery. And so her vision was incredible. And um, she says, look on the fence and I'll be darned if not a quarter of a mile, did she not spot this owl? And I'm like, how did you see that? He never, you know, he wasn't moving. He was just, you know, up on this pole. And so I pulled over close enough to get a shot, but a little far enough to not scare him. And I opened my car door and I took two shots. Both shots, he wasn't looking at me, but he's an owl, it doesn't matter. And I opened the door a little bit wider so I could like lean out of my car a little bit more. And I still got another couple of shots, still not looking at me. Um, it doesn't matter, he's an owl. And at that point I said, mom, I've got to get out. And I know he's gonna fly, I know he's gonna fly. And I was able to get out, I got some shots. They were, you know, they weren't perfect he's an owl and the excitement of seeing him so close was an amazing experience. And so I started approaching him 
And I thought, all right, you've got to give him room. And I gave him plenty of room. And I was able this. So he's on a fence line. He's on his post. I was able to walk the entire area. So that's 180 degrees. And I was able to get shots of him at every different angle. And I made it back to the car. And my mom said, are you happy? And I said, oh, my gosh, I can't believe I got an owl picture. And so I grabbed another lens and I started again, knowing full well he's going to take off. And he didn't. And I was able to do that same um, little, you know, diameter, you know, you walk around to that walk around to get him. And I made it back to the car and I said, I'm just going to try. I know he's going to take off, but I pulled out my tripod and I set up some video and I was able to get some video. And he got so bored with me. At one point he fell asleep, but I got back in the car and I thought enough, we need to let him go. And, um, he never took off and I was able to get a huge amount of photos of him. And I'm super, super excited that I have a camera that allows me to zoom in and crop um, where it's just this beautiful, beautiful profile picture of a portrait of him. So the lesson here is <laughs> um, if you let a spotter go with you, don't let them fall asleep and put them to work. And um, I, you know, I put on my seatbelt and I put my car in, in, in drive and my mom said, are you happy? And I said, oh, I cannot believe that I've got the shot. I cannot believe it. She's like, great. You owe me $20. And so, um, you've got to know my mom to understand that, but, um, that was a really wonderful experience to share with her because I genuinely was excited and she was genuinely excited for me. This little guy is a Mexican ground squirrel and I saw him scurry and then he jumped up on this old cattle guard. That's, this is the first time that I had ever seen a Mexican ground squirrel. I didn't know what he, what he was. I actually had to look him up after I finished photographing him. And um, this is kind of an ode to, this is on Easter and you know Easter is the day for prayer. And my dad was a very devout Catholic man and he always carried a, a rosary in his pocket and when this little squirrel got up and you know pressed his hands together, I think there's a word that um, anthropomorphic, I'm not quite sure that I pronounced it correctly, but it's when we give human traits to animals. And I know that there's a lot of controversy in it, but in this instance, I did it and I don't care because it was a very special, special moment. In truth and, and to be, um, uh, to to, he wasn't praying. He actually had food in his hand, but from the angle of this image, I was able to, you know, turn it into my story. And that's what he's doing. Weather, you know, we're always as photographers, I'm very fascinated by the weather. And if you get a chance of, of photographing a storm, take it. We never got rain out of the storm, but with the, the gold grasses and the old, um, these we satch trees, um, that have lost their leaves. This is December. I was able to spot that big ball of mistletoe. And I just thought between the gold grasses and the dark, dark blue gray sky and the silvery um, bark off those trees, this, there's not a lot of beautiful landscapes in the area that I'm photographing, but this is one of the images that I, it represents to me what South Texas is. It's brush country. It's, you know, it's flat. Um, in the winter time, everything loses its leaves and it's, it goes brown. But if you get some beautiful sky, take advantage of that and take some photos. On the other side of it, I had never seen fog in this area. And this is on a cold February morning. And I remember driving through it and I thought, I'm just going to stop and take a photo of it. And the sun was actually coming up um, through that a little bit to the left of this photo. And I thought the, the, the color of the sky that it produced was that soft, you know, apricot color that I hadn't seen. And, and that's one of those things. If you get good weather or get any kind of weather, you know, take those photos because they really do add a little bit of um, variety to your portfolio. Because I've gone down these roads for years and years, I know where the golden fronted woodpecker lives. What I didn't realize is that he had a friend and together they have 
built a nest in these old mesquite trees. And the first time I noticed the, the nest, I thought, I wonder if anybody's in it. And I drove up, I'm in my car, I drove right up next to it. And I could hear the noise vibrating out of this tree. And I realized those are the babies. And so I pulled over a little bit to get out of the way in case mom and dad came back. And sure enough, they did. And for an hour and a half, I watched them tag team. Dad would go in, feed them, fly out. Mom would come in and it just repeated for a very, very long time. They actually did it longer than I was, than I had time to, to stay and watch. But because you start recognizing, you know, when you start going back to the same place, you start getting into the habitat, you start noticing changes in that habitat. And I have driven past this particular row of mesquite trees for years, and I had never noticed that nest until one day. And then now I can't unsee it. But um, it's just kind of fun. Yes, you you always want to get that photo of them up close and personal. And I did that. But for this particular shot, I wanted to show you kind of them in their environment and them doing what they do when they're not being um, irritated by a photographer. So up close and personal, this is dad. He's a golden fronted woodpecker. And he is such a great dad because the variety of food that he brought back for the, for the babies, the variety is incredible. I've got photos of him bringing berries, grasshoppers, worms. Um, and this is all in the same, you know, hour and a half sitting, just watching him bring things to them. All right. I have, I, I come from the, you know, show only your best work. And my friend Ruth White says, no, show people your mistakes. And I had been photographing um, really low. I had been photographing a turtle at the time. And this pipevine uh, swallowtail flew by. And I was, that was my first time to really notice it. And I thought, oh my goodness. So I'm taking photos of it because it's bouncing um, all over these wild sunflowers. And I had taken, I don't know, 20, 30 shots. And then the swallowtail is gone. And I am so excited. And I look at the back of my camera and this is what I see. And I, I know it's happened to other people where you just kind of lose your, your breath because you're like <laughs> all kinds of, you know, not so nice words come out of your mouth. And that's what happened to me. I have been mentored by a gentleman uh, for a few years, and he always told me, Linda, he's 87 years old, he's a retired commercial photographer, he says, even the bad photos can be saved, so don't delete them. Don't delete them until you know you've, they're, they're goners. So this is one particular photo that I, I just didn't delete, and it took me about eight months to pull up and, and sit down and, and see what I could do with it. And with the post-processing software that we use, whether it's Lightroom or Photoshop or whatever you use, play with the sliders, play with the lines, pull color out of it. And so because I was willing to do that and not hit delete, this is an image that I got. Now, is this the butterfly I saw? No, it's very, um, it's almost like graphic, uh, kind of a graphic design. But I know it's the swallowtail. I know it's a pipevine swallowtail. I know it's a sunflower. And it's very, very um, post-processed. And of all the photos that I have in my collection, and I have a lot of them, I'm almost embarrassed to admit how many for this project, this is my favorite image that I've taken on Gully Road. And it's, it represents all the mistakes I've made as a photographer and all of the, um, the challenges that I've had as an editor. And this is one of those photos that just means a whole lot to me. So for those photos that you think are, you know, throwaways, just give them a chance. All right. I was coming down Gully Road and um, there was nothing in the road. I knew the sunset was going to be bright and golden. It was going to be orangey or yellow, but there were no clouds in the sky. And I thought, do I stop? I'm not sure. 
there's nothing, there's no foreground in this photo, just stop, you know, just always stop. So I stopped, I took my shot at a wide angle lens on, I got so much sky in, in the photo that I kept. Um, and then I remember looking at the back of my camera going, that's kind of pretty, too bad there's not anything in it. And I looked up, I don't know where she came from, but all of a sudden this doe has gotten to the middle of the road. I reached in, I was able to very, very, I don't think I've ever changed a lens that quickly, but I got my um, 200 to 500 on it. And I got two shots, I rattled off two shots before she went completely across the road. And this shot is what I have kind of um, said to myself, this is what represents Gully Road to me. It's full of surprises. It's full of challenges. Sometimes it's a full of nothing, but it's, it's these wonderful moments that if you're not paying attention, you're gonna miss them. So Mr. Gully was a farmer that my parents knew when I was a kid. And over the years, you know, the fences around this area, they've been taken down and land's been sold and, you know, new fences go up. And I wander along what I have mapped out as a 25 mile radius of red dirt, caliche, and sometimes muddy roads. But they give me permission to put my phone on mute and allow me to witness sunrises and to observe wildlife, to learn about insects and birds, lots and lots and lots of birds. But most importantly, I've learned patience and I've become a better naturalist and maybe even a better photographer. We have all experienced what house arrest is under COVID restrictions. And even though it's harder to travel to those, um, what, what, what I call those exotic bucket list places, you can still find something closer to home to practice on. Don't use that as an excuse because on a back road, you're gonna get an opportunity to try different types of photography, whether it's macro, landscape, um, wildlife, even astrophotography, if you're lucky enough to live somewhere that um, doesn't have a lot of light pollution. So I wanna challenge you to get in your car, to drive down that back road that you've never driven down before. Go slow, roll down your window and look and listen. And even if you don't see anything interesting, go back the next day and the next day. Because when you train yourself to really look, you'll start noticing things that you'll find interesting. And only then will you start making those photographs that tell a story that no one else has told yet. So thank you guys for allowing me to take you along for a ride down what I call Gully Road. So um, you can connect with me through my website at lindanickel.com. Uh, Ruth mentioned it. I host a photography webinar on Wednesdays. It's free for anyone that has a Zoom link. You just click in, go to my website. There's a link under happiness hour. And if you are you know, if, if Wednesdays don't work out for you and you want to see what we're doing, I post all of those um, to my YouTube channel. And you can find me at uh, on Instagram a lot, almost every day at Cousin Linda. Linda, you are simply amazing. You don't, <laughs> you don't like to write. You don't like to, to do slideshows. You don't like to do this. You don't like to do that. You have everybody fooled, I think. Let me um, this is definitely outside my comfort zone. So um, <laughs> thank you for giving me the opportunity to, to do this and share some stuff that I've been doing. Um, you know, if, if you do follow me on, on Instagram, you know that I'm a huge traveler. I, I live for the next plane ride and photographing South Texas never, ever occurred to me. But because I'd been doing it for a while. Um, COVID, yeah, COVID was very difficult, but I had a place to go. And 
Um, I felt safe out there. I could do what I wanted to do so I could be creative. And um, it was, it was, it's my little sanctuary. So I really hope people, if you don't already have a spot, go find one. And um, I just, I just can't uh, thank you all enough for coming to watch Linda because she really deserves um, a lot of attention for what she does. It's amazing. She was the one who traveled all over the world all of the time. And she's been sort of reduced to Texas, which is not small, but um, traveling Texas, uh, that's quite a bit smaller than the world. And, and yet look what she's done. So um, thank you so much, Linda. You're very, very welcome. Um, you know, I appreciate you, Ruth, because, you know, you've come and joined us on the happy hour several, several times, and uh, I'm paying that favor back. <laughs> <laughs> As a um, I would like to open up the floor if anybody has any questions or comments. I know you're going to get all kinds of wonderful comments, but if anybody has specific questions, um, would love to hear from you now. Hi, this is Chad Marino, one of your Monep guests. I uh, used to live in Texas, and when I did years and years ago, Highway 16, which runs almost virtually north to south, was always a place I wanted to slowly explore. Have you done that since it's fairly close to your neighborhood? Are you talking to me? Yes, or who, anyone. Yeah, um, I'm not familiar with Highway 16. Where, where does that go through? It starts down around 83 towards Zapata and between Zapata and Laredo goes all the way up to Kerrville up. Uh, I think it goes almost all the way to Wichita Falls. It, it goes wow. very far. It's a, it's a long highway. It's a wonderful yeah. highway. Yeah, I know I've crossed it, but I, I haven't. Um, you know, this, the back road idea to me is very, very new because Back roads were not something I was interested in. It just became my project. And I, I limit myself to just this one area. But if anybody else has been down that road, please help Ted out. I think it's a wonderful road. It's mostly a two-lane road. I think it would be one that you would have a lot of fun on, Linda. Yeah. One of the things about doing back roads is, for me, is to go back over and over and over. Because I've been driving this stretch for, oh, we're coming up on three and a half years. I know it. I know all the curves. I know where the cardinals nest. I know where I can find butterflies very consistently. Um, because when you start going to those, some, some place that you're familiar with, um, you just, you just know where things are. And because we're in the bird migration path, you know, I kind of know when the, the Baltimore Orioles are coming through and they, I don't know, they're creatures of habit. They like a certain part of this road and I've never seen them in any other part of, of the road. And, and I'm traveling about 25 miles, you know, up and down. Sometimes I'll go down the same road <laughs> eight, nine times in a row, just because what did I miss? So, yeah. So I, for me, the trick is to go down the same area. So I'm, I'm familiar with it. Linda. Yes, sir. Hi, David. Hi, Linda. Uh, are these roads county roads? Are they county maintained? Yeah, okay. So, uh, so I venture down farm to market roads. And then what I do is I I just happened to pick a road because I knew it when I was a kid. This is where the farm, Mr. Gully's farm was. So they are, they're not, I don't know that the county maintains them. I, they are red dirt roads or caliche roads um, because there's so much oil activity or was down there a couple of years ago. They have built these roads to get those big trucks in and out. And for me, you know, on a Saturday and Sunday, those truckers are in there, but they're not as, uh, it's not heavily trafficked when I'm down there. So occasionally when I'm pulled over, maybe one of the um, farm hands or maybe an oil guy will stop and go, they always ask me, are you okay? They, they assume that my I'm having car trouble. Um, but I don't, um, I don't really know who maintains those roads. Um, a lot of those are, you know, all this, I would say there's just a few maize fields left, but most of them are ranches. Um, so I assume that the county does maintain them, but I've never seen them down there. So, so you don't think you're getting onto private property? Oh, I am absolutely not on private property. 
Okay. Because I grew up down there. I know better than to, uh, I don't go through fences. I, I, even if there's something right on the other side of it, my lens might go through the fence, but Linda does not step through a fence. That's just one of those things that I was taught very young. Um, but so I'm, I'm assuming that these are um, some form of county maintained roads. Yeah. Uh, do you use the Roads of Texas book? Birds of Texas book? No, Roads of Texas. No. Mm -mm. That's very detailed county. I okay. count all through Texas. Okay. All the roads that are public roads in Texas. Okay. I'm just wondering if yeah. you were using that to find your roads or to navigate with or what. Mm -hmm. No, I haven't. But, you know, honestly, for me, um, you know, I live north of Austin and I've been, there's a, uh, what is he called? Um, a little owl. I can't think of what it was. Uh, there's a little owl that I was going to visit daily. And I thought Granger is such a cool little community. I should drive around those back roads. And I have, but I don't, I don't think to go out there every weekend. Whereas I go down the gully road area because I'm down to visit my mom. And while she sleeps, it's something I can do until she, she's ready for lunch. So, um, yeah. I'm not opposed to other roads, but for me, this project is, it, it's just right in this little area. And um, so I've, I've kind of, I put a limit on myself and what I'm doing with it. In fact, whenever, I mean, I've got some great wildlife pictures um, outside of my little plotted out, you know, radius um, of land, but I don't include them in the gully road. Uh, they have to be taken in this area for me to call it a gully road picture. Well, it was a great presentation. Really enjoyed it. Thank you, David. And as a participant on the Happiness Hour, let me tell you, please remind me to be nicer to my speakers. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? Great presentation, Linda. You deliver Thanks. well. I'm sorry? I said you deliver well. Uh, well. Very well. And, and I made a comment like with your photos and your words, it would be a wonderful book, The Gully well, Road Project. All right, people that work on projects, put your work into a book. This is something that I did for myself. It's my own coffee table book. No one else has really seen it, but this is for me. Because you know, when we, when we post our photos and we we're editing our photos, they're all backlit. They're going to be beautiful. So you've got to print those images to make sure that the photos really what represents what you shot. So make sure you do that. So thank you, Mika. And no, <laughs> I actually thought about doing it at one point and I got very overwhelmed with other things. So um, I've been well, keep it in the back of your mind because yeah. really with the stories behind it too, it's just like such a meaningful project, I think. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Well, from everybody, uh, including me, Linda, I'm so glad you were able to do this. It was a little bit of an arm twist to get you to say yes. I <laughs> yes. That is an understatement. I think I rejected you a couple of times. Yeah, you did. You sort of came back. <laughs> ignored me a couple of times, not totally, but she was, mm, yeah. but uh, no, I'm so glad that you finally agreed to do it. And we set the date and you were ready a month ago. I mean, we talked about that. She's, um, she's a great storyteller and she's thoroughly organized and um, puts on a great show and hope to have you back. Uh, this meeting has been recorded. She's saying no, but see, she says no. Yeah. <laughs> she says yes again. So yeah. We'll have her back again sometime. Bye.